Hello legends, welcome back to another episode of Does It Hurt When You Do That? Don't Do That, the podcast where I, JJ, talk to interesting people about the things that they do and don't do that hurt and other stuff. And this episode today is super exciting. Um, Well, firstly, how are you? Uh, Here we are in December of 2021. Um, All kinds of feelings are going through you all, I imagine. For those of you who have stayed tuned with me, I'm out of hotel quarantine and am here in a inspiration station. No isolation needed um, at my mum's place in Cambridge. Aotearoa. So today's interview is my first and only face-to-face interview. Every other guest I've had, we were only able to meet online. And this one uh, was recorded in Pōneke, Wellington, in the foyer of the Bats Theatre in March 2021, when um, me and the guest, George Fowler, were there for the New Zealand Fringe Festival. So George Fowler is known by his stage name, Hugo Girl, and he's a drag king comedian and cabaret producer. He won the inaugural season of House of Drag and was the first drag king and first trans man to compete on a drag reality show. It was the first time I met George face to face and I get pretty awkward because I was fangirling about how much of a production mogul he is and this episode is super refreshing and awesome because he's super blunt and upfront about the physical pain of recovering from top surgery which is having tits removed part of his transition to um, be a trans man and this is so cool because I don't know about you but there's lots of taboos about bodies really and trans bodies as well so to hear someone talking so authentically about their experience within their body as well as you know that whole layer of hating yourself because you aren't aligned the physical isn't aligned with who you feel who you are amongst this we also talk about theater artists we talk about call out versus call in culture I end up talking about my morning routine and the tv show my strange addiction and also we get approached by a dog since we're in a public space and some people and I left all of that in the edit because you know it's more real life And if you think that the sound quality is really good, it's because we're talking into the precious sound equipment of my dear mate Tane Hipongo. Shout out to you, Tane. Thank you so much, you legend. And I want to let you know there's a few swears. George doesn't um, lay back with the F's and the C's. Um, Not fish and chips, but the, I'm not going to say the swear words. You can figure out what F word is and S word and the C and stuff. Um, So... Turn yourself away if you're not up for that today. But otherwise, this, I don't think it's going to be my last episode for the year. I reckon I'll do a wee solo wrap up one. Uh, Also, I am looking for more guests in 2022. So if you are someone who's like, yo, I think that I would love to chat to you about the cool stuff I know and do. And I've also had some people tell me that I should talk to, because I actually meet some really weird random people. Like I meet interesting people like the ones that we've had and I really appreciate those of you who have uh, listened along and and really enjoyed uh, the chats with the people who are quite prolific. But yeah, would you like me to talk to some of the really weird, and well we're all weird, but you know, Real left field kind of random chance happen upon interactions that I have. Would you like to hear some of that stuff? Go on, write to me. I say this every week. Please, I want to hear from you. I like you all and I need your company. Because clearly I'm talking into a microphone by myself when I'm a live performer who's normally used to the instant gratification of seeing people actually laugh. Don't make me big. Anyway, if you are a guest or you know a guest or if you have like a really weird uncle um, or auntie or neighbor, please send them my way. 
So wherever you are, I'm going to leave you, my friends, with the wonderful chat I had with George Fowler. All right, welcome. Hello, my guest. Hello, my host. (laughs) You know what's super weird is talking into a microphone and not having it be projected somewhere? I'm like, it's broken. That's so true, actually. (laughs) I need to not have these headphones in because it's going to wig me out. It's kind of like when you see yourself in your phone camera and you're looking back at yourself. Yeah. Um, So, who are you? Hello, my name's George Fowler. Some people know me as Hugo Girl. I'm a human, or maybe I'm not. Uh, and I live in Wellington, New Zealand. And it's beautiful to be here in Wellington, New Zealand, talking yes. to you. Thank you so much for coming. I uh, I met George on the internet uh, a few months ago when I first moved here, um, asking about shows and the knack and everything like that, and I really appreciate that now we can be face-to-face. Yes. And this is actually my first face-to-face actual podcast interview, because the other ones have been on Zoom. So Of course. Yeah, very cool. It's very cool. Yes, we live in a magical utopia where COVID is not for now. That's right. Yes. Okay, so does it hurt when you do that? Don't do that. What is, if you can come up with any answer, there's no wrong here, that? I'm. That's such a huge question. And uh, as I'm sure many of your guests are, I'm completely unprepared for it. So I can think of something that hurts that's good. Like, and of course, my first thought when I'm asked that question is like what hurts physically is that I'm recovering from top surgery and so I really should be working out a lot more than I am and like stretching and shit and I'm not because it hurts and I don't like it and it makes me uncomfortable. Top surgery that is a large change Mm. to go under in life. Yes quite large quite large so I got it three months ago so I'm fully in the clear to like start moving properly and like rehabilitating and I'm just stiff as shit, like all my back muscles are, you know, because my whole t- top half of my torso is like sitting somewhere different. Um, so I can only just do child's pose like now. Yeah. You know. A push-ups in your repertoire before Abs- the surgery? Yeah, before. Holy shit, not now. <laughs> like I'm s- I've got such little dangly T-Rex arms now. Yeah. And it's it makes me feel like shit. It makes me feel real like, out of control with my body, you know. So I have to do it, but I'm not doing it. Yeah, I could imagine that for that, though, I'd be interested for you to share experience, what you said about being out of control of your body before you had the surgery. Uh, was it a case where you were like, well, this isn't my body? Absolutely. Yeah, so it's quite it's quite strange right now because I'm taking all the, like, productive steps into feeling good. But um, it's resulted in, like, a great sense of, like, I feel great and being able to make choices to make myself feel and look better. But, you know, all these side effects, like, this is so too much information. But turns out when you're on testosterone, you're, like, susceptible to UTI. So I've just had this fucking string of, like, and couldn't figure it out. And then, like, no doctors knew about it, but, like, the trans boys on the internet did because you get, like, postmenopausal symptoms, which, like, fucks up your levels or whatever. Uh, And then my skin is, like, fucking erupting and my back fucking hurts and I just feel oh and I put on a bunch of weight because of testosterone so in my attempts to get more in control of my body I'm actually right at this moment feeling just shitty so yeah how does that tie into your question I think that that is well I mean the fact that you're telling me that yeah you know we only met properly 10 minutes ago yeah like that's um pretty courageous and also like yeah Feeling shitty, <laughs> far out. All the ways I've been feeling shitty this week. Mate. It's just like they just come in. I was going to say about back to the stretching thing that like maybe you could become like one of those middle-aged men in Lycra who's just like always sticking his leg like up on a table. So you're like always just doing your stretches. Hi, I'm doing my stretches. You're describing my future. That's it. <laughs> that is it. I want to make people feel uncomfortable with my level of comfort with my body. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I uh, my one of the topics that has come up is I guess that that sense of being comfortable in your own skin and like, hey, we're in the foyer at Bats, by the way. It's yeah. fine. 
I said hi. We can cut it. We can do it in post. Yeah, or just leave it in. Or just leave it in. It's probably going to be in. Great. (laughs) We don't have time for post-production. Yeah, so feeling comfortable in your own skin. uh, Do you have little everyday steps or little things that you do to help with that? I'm going to say no because none spring to mind. So, like... No, I'm like, I know things that make me feel better. Do I do them every day? Fuck no. Because <laughs> those people are boring. <laughs> yeah, mate. <laughs> Who has the wherewithal to find a daily routine? Fuck. Yeah. What's your secret? Yeah. We, uh, well, I always say that my secret to my morning routine is that it starts the night before. Uh-huh. Yeah. Talk um, me through it. Okay, so, well... Going to bed, uh, like when I'm lying in bed, I'm like all tucked up and I kind of like wriggle in the sheets and I'm like, ah, and I kind of visualize waking up in the morning. And I visualize either waking up and just like rolling over and looking at my phone and being like, shit, I don't have enough time. Duh, 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 duh. And then the other way that I imagine waking up is like I sit up like a Disney princess. I'm like, oh. And I just like gracefully look out the window and like there's birds flying above. And when I'm in bed, that's like the way that I decide that I'm going to wake up for the next day. And well, Do you do it? Yeah, a lot of the time. Yeah, I wake up. I don't always do the, oh. <laughs> but I often wake up and like try and feel quite optimistic. And I meditate most days as well, which I call it, I, I, it's like I reframed it to call it hanging out in my mind palace. Sometimes it's the sex dungeon. Yeah. It's, uh, it helps. Yeah. I mean, you're onto it. You got it. You got it sorted. Some visualization. Oh, we all, oh, well, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, we, we've got our, our different ways and, and tricks and everything like that. Have you found that like sharing the last three months with people? How have you found that? Have you found people's reactions? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I talk about it because otherwise I'd be like ashamed of it, you know, like I think, and I find it interesting to suss it out and people find it, you know, it's a reasonably rare thing to, you know, willingly undergo all these interesting changes. So, yeah, I talk about it to like kind of talk the shame out of my body. This is fine. That's just – and also like so it's been a wonderful magical process, the whole process of coming out. But I also like talking about the – how it's tough. I mean, and I just listed the phys- how it's tough physically on my body right now. Like it's tough in so many ways, and like we don't need to be like trans is fine and great and amazing. Like we can talk about the fact that it's a hard thing to go through too. That's important as well. I talk about it because it's therapy. <laughs> Secrecy is like what breeds shame. That's what Brene Brown says oh Brene yeah I know my wife (laughs) yeah (laughs) one day one day I'll meet her that's something which we said off the mic is that I have found is the thing that I'm doing at the moment that like it hurts is to talk about it I've found though as soon as I do it just kind of starts to melt away a little bit yeah absolutely yeah and just I spent my whole life before this feeling overwhelmed with guilt and shame and then a good portion of my life terrified of this deep dark secret horrible freakish thing you know I've fucking waited long enough the worst thing that can happen by me talking this out is someone's like oh (laughs) you know like it's not what am I trying to say the uh, the Positives far outweigh the negatives mm. at this stage. Life's fucking short. Mm. And if we're, if you're like me, we, we can be really mean to ourselves in some ways. The person who, how they react, probably isn't as mean as what you might have been to yourself for like a really long time. Oi, no <laughs> one, no one can possibly be. You are so right. That's Is so it true. A voice? Is it your voice? How does yours work? Yeah, it's fully a voice. Sometimes it's like a, it's like a, it feels like I'll, like a, ugh, almost like feeling that like punches you in the chest. But yeah, it's a voice. There's a really good dog. You can pet the dog. Hello, dog. Yeah, it is a really good dog. Yeah, it's a wolf. 
<laughs> Good going up the stairs. He knows where he's going. Yeah, to the office here at Bats Wellington. I think I know something. Uh, does it feel bad? What's the question again? Does it hurt when you do that? Don't do that. Great. What yeah, is that? I think something I know what it is. Well, do. something I'm thinking about, which again we just talked about, and before we started recording, is like burnout, burnout in the arts, and like saying yes too much. I made like a big, a bunch of big changes in my life to make my schedule a bit more reasonable and to set some like real strong boundaries about what I'm doing. And then fully intended to commit to that, but because of how festivals work in Pornicky and in New Zealand, they just all overlap. And some, and I've, I cannot say no to so many of the things that I have on my roster currently. And I'm really struggling with that. What it turns into is like, so hang on, here's here's a good example. So I basically have quit cabaret. Like I'm just working in events management and like theatre now. And that's resulted in me falling in love with cabaret again because it got, I got so tired that there was, it was, not only did I not enjoy it, but I grew to like hate it, you know, and hate the process. And now I'm like, ooh, I'm going to make a little costume. I'm going to make a little act. I'm going to do it. I'm excited. I get to choose. I have the choice to to perform. But yeah, I'm just thinking about that a lot at the moment because I'm like, remember how this was really, really shit and you made all these choices to not be here again and you are here again? Maybe let's not do that. It's hard though, setting up those boundaries and saying no, especially I'm finding after having that scarcity of a whole time period where there was no stage time because of the pandemic, that I'm feeling the need to take whatever is coming. And also like <laughs> to, to physically know that it might not actually mean saying no, but it also could be things like scheduling that time off. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And but when you get to the point where the thing that you love and you started doing it because you love, then it feels like a chore to actually like start to listen to that. I'm so glad Absolutely. you're falling in love with Cabaret again. Thank you. I just want to say that it's I, – I promise it's not a humble brag being like, oh, we can do so much art in New Zealand or whatever, and I'm not. it's not a humble brag like, oh, my God, I'm so haha, booked and blessed. Artists of, of any any person of any like level in, in arts or I guess any hobby – but arts in particular, people seem to get overbooked and burnt out emotionally and physically so quickly. So I don't think this is – I just want to clarify that I'm not like, oh, my God, my life's so hard, I'm so busy, because that's not what's up. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And it can happen in many different ways and guises as well. Burnout, it's like I, – I describe it as like you just – don't give a shit. Fuck no. <laughs> yeah. And so like I'm I'm fully in this zone right now. Like opened my emails yesterday morning and was just like on the verge of tears for like the whole day. It's so shit, eh? And so yeah, it just feels like numb and dread. Like I can't even really get to a point of like stressed panic anymore. It's just like Ugh. And my brain feels really locked on. So, like, I just know what my to-do list is and can't stop thinking about it. And it's a sense of, like, trappedness, you know? So it's like I've already spent a long time staring at my calendar trying to figure out what to, to drop, and I can't. So how do I, you know? And that's that feeling of, like, not having a choice, feeling really stuck. And where's the room to be, like a joyful person to be around and be creative or to make good shit in that zone. It's fucking nowhere. It's astounding that, like, we work at artists this hard and then expect perfection. I hate it. Thanks so much for fitting this in, considering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, no, nah, it's, well, we're, th thanks. This is a fun thing. This is a nice thing. Yeah. And also, it just worked really well and, yeah. yeah. Two birds, one stone. Yeah. Um, that's good. Yeah, it's uh, so true. Like creativity, I feel like, needs joy. It needs joy, space and boundaries. Have you – there's this really great book that – because obviously I struggle with burnout a lot and I have these women in my life I call my gay aunties and they are boss professionals and I think – it wasn't even for an occasion. She just bought me some books, this amazing woman called Megan Whelan. And one of them is called Burnout and the other one is called Bored But Brilliant. And it's about that specifically, about how your brain needs heaps of space and silence and rest, oh my God, rest, to process, to churn through problems, to 
make new solutions and that's like exactly what creativity is and that's exa- exactly how I've found my life to be. You know, it's, it's why you have great ideas in the shower. But imagine if your whole life could be a shower. Yeah, your mm. whole life could be a shower. Mm-hmm. <gasps> that would be great. It would be. It would be very bad for the environment. It would be bad for the environment. I... It would be bad for your skin. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, you'd, <laughs> you'd get chafed. <laughs> I feel like that would be a great thing for that TV show, My Strange Addiction. Have you seen it? I'm unfamiliar. Okay, so it's a British reality TV show called My Strange Addiction. Or maybe it's American. And it's people who have these really odd addictions. Like there was this man who was addicted to his spin bike. So he trained, he like adjusted his spin bike so he could do his whole life from the spin bike. And it like shortens his hips so much that he couldn't even walk to his daughter's graduation. And he was reluctant to believe that it was the cycling that was causing that. There was another um, woman who was addicted to taxidermy and she'd like take dates with her to go exploring for dead creatures. And um, Sounds like a dream date, to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) To be quite frank, yes. (laughs) Hey, would you like to come and have some dead people and uh, not people? No, not people. (laughs) Let's go scavenge for like a cute little dead mouse that you can stuff. Weird, but I'm into it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think I might have seen like a YouTube clip of someone like eating eating couch stuffing or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So the 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 life shower could potentially go too far to that. Mm. Okay. So where do you go if you have a secret? space or not so secret that you would share that helps you find space or feel like creative that you feel is like creative and wonderful Mm, great question I'm not sure I have an answer to it I have spaces that make me feel good I like don't spend money on like human clothes or like fancy meals or whatever but the thing I splurge on is massages (laughs) because you know I'm a person who spent like so long just feeling so uncomfortable in my own body and like it's just and it always makes me feel better, even if I just get like a 15 minute little back rub and just like human touch is like amazing. And obviously my back's sore all the fucking time. So yeah, I if I think about something I know will make me feel better, it's a back rub. And also I find getting in a body of water just resets me like no one's business. Yeah, I've really taken to screaming underwater recently. Wow. <laughs> underwater screaming. <laughs> it's pretty good. Also, when I go to the sea, just crouching down and letting the wave like hit me up and in my face. Um, it's That's like hardcore. A, yeah, it's yeah. like a sinus thing and oh, the eyes. Oh, God, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's just, do I need to ask you the question? Does it hurt when you do but that? I, Maybe don't, don't do, do that. that. Yeah, uh, nah, it, I, it would only hurt. It only hurts sometimes if there's a lot of sand um, being stirred up. Um, mm. There was some of that at Foxton Beach the other day, mm. which is where I went. If you were to look at the world and if, or you, if you were to look out on the streets and be like, oh, you guys, you people, does it hurt when you do that? Don't do that. Or if there was like one particular person in your life or group of people that you could say this to. Mm. I think... I feel like you're asking for, like, what grinds my gears? Life advice. You to can give me that, yeah. Yeah, I think I have two things. One is, like, gender presentation or, like, self-expression and stuff. I feel like we're in quite a unique space where, like, gender roles for kids and stuff are so fucked up. The world really prescribes this, like, really narrow view of, like, what you can be a lot of the time. You know, like, this, that you can go so wide with that. Even, like... We keep kids in the education system for, like, two decades. Like, that's fucked and and gender is real fucked and capitalism is real fucked. So, yeah, I don't know. It's always – I have benefited so massively personally from just, like, questioning who I am and what I do and actually taking a hard intuitive look at what feels good for me and obviously for me personally, like – I'm a man. I spent a long time really fucking hating myself. So, and not realizing that that was like a possibility that a human being can make changes as big as that to, and that, that you're worthy of that. You, any change, if it makes you happier is absolutely worth it. Quit your job, dump your partner. In my case, 
chop off your titties, do whatever. Like, whatever it is, it's worth it if you get to be happy. Because change is so scary for, for a lot of people, right? And we like certainty, but that that you have seen that and experienced that and are sharing that is, um, is very cool, very inspirational. Has it been expensive? The transitioning? Yeah. yeah. I visualise it as like being on a really expensive mobile plan. <laughs> you know, like I pay a dollar a day for my phone – which I use constantly, but I also live in my body longer than I'm attached to my phone. So I don't know. So I budgeted it out like to get testosterone. It's like, like $2 a day because <laughs> it's like for the monthly fees, the doctor's appointment to get the prescription, getting the prescription, getting a nurse to administer it. And, and then obviously I paid a fuckload of money for, for surgery. So ugh. Mm. Ugh. yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. It's time consuming. So is like therapy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yep, still can't afford that one. <laughs> and I mean, well, we're privileged to be here and able to do this as far as Maslow's hierarchy of needs go. Excuse me, what? Um, so basically, this psychologist Maslow has this hierarchy of needs. It's like a food pyramid, a triangle. And so the bottom is like safe, like air, water, shelter. And then the next one up is like I'm probably gonna get this wrong, but it's like community. Yeah. And then there's uh, like love and relationships. Mm. And then at the top is self actualization. Oh yeah, good. So you not got the time to be sitting on couches in a theatre foyer talking about philosophy and life <laughs> if we're out having to figure out where we're gonna sleep tonight. Yeah, absolutely. That being said, like within it's just understanding that if you've got these layers sorted as they go then you might have more space at the top for these sorts of things. Yeah. Cool. Great. Yep. Mm. That actually, I was expecting like a real complicated new idea, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Yes. Um, uh, do you know they put internet access on like in the human rights thing, like that every person should have access to the internet? Wow. I'm fairly is, confident. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I listened to a podcast once. I'm an expert, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> we all are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That makes sense, though, because it is pretty tricky it's, without it. It's pervasive, yeah. Like, you can't you can't do a lot of stuff required to be alive as a human if you don't have access to the internet nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been phoneless for a period in your life without, before they were, like... No, I guess not. Yeah. I mean, we're so privileged in so many ways, yeah. Mm. Um, okay, and then... Um, oh, she dancing. You can ask me a question. How do you get into arts? I was a theatre kid growing up. Okay. And I'm the youngest of four. My parents really liked singing and they took me to shows and things. And I also did really well at school. And so I thought when I finished secondary school, like I was doing choreography and everything, lots of extracurriculars and dancing. And I thought that I was going to go to university because I was like ducks. I got like money and stuff. And then when I was in London, I knew I wanted to spend some time overseas and seeing shows on the West End. I was like, this is what I want to do. And so I moved to Melbourne and, and started doing it. And then in terms of making my own work, I'd always started making skits and things when I was young. But then in like full-time training institutions, lots of people often, well, I got kind of brainwashed, like just trying to fit a mould. And then I got sick of not getting gigs or the gigs that I was getting was often for my brain and my choreography or my direction and ability or my writing. And then fortunately I had someone mentor me that was just like, make your own show and I'll, I'll do it. I'll mentor you. Yeah. Bomb. How did you get into it? Gender identity crisis. Ah. Yeah. So the opposite, I guess. Yeah. What I, age were you? Oh, I mean, so I have been creative. So like I did bits and pieces. Sounds less intense than your trajectory, but like did like speech and drama in high school and like I've had a little bit of dance experience. But yeah, then I came to university drank myself half to death and then just like must have been six years ago now just like started dressing as a dude and I was sort of surrounded by people like in cabaret and burlesque and so what it seemed like I was doing was like creating a character and I was I was like this is a character this is a costume this is fine and sort of putting all that on stage 
and then yeah lots of people you know drag isn't just a, a factory for trans people but for some of us it is like we we learn about how to express our gender in a way that's safe and glittery and fun and performative and then it becomes true and my drag mom Judy Virago says you it teaches you to grow your wings until you don't need your wings anymore. That's wonderful. And so in some ways, because you're not performing as much, do you feel like your wings are... I don't need it need as them. much as I did anymore, for sure. My early drag costumes have done this wonderful full circle thing where they're now my boy clothes. They're not just things that I only feel brave enough to wear on stage anymore. And yeah, drag teaches you how to be brave, for sure. If you can... You know, I had such bad anxiety, but then I'd just do these, like, these things I never thought would be possible on stage, and then suddenly the world didn't seem that scary anymore, you know? Now we're talking during the New Zealand Fringe Festival, and I think that that's something that I'm seeing and, and being reminded of is, like, that the escape and the place that theatre gives is so special. Kia ora. <laughs> um, we're recording a podcast. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, it's just, you know, it's just Taika Waititi. We're just hanging out. In Obviously, the yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, ja- and Dame Judy Dench That's as well. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Julie Andrews is going to come by, I think, um, in a moment. Um, yeah, because I was going to ask you when you were talking about I guess that that period where you were super uncomfortable in your skin, then what what it was like uh, showing yourself on stage. Did you feel like there was much of a divide in terms of who that person was? Absolutely. So I even thought I was like, so I called myself like a, a transvestite because that like that described how intensely the, how important cross dressing was to me. And I even thought I might have been like by gender because I was like dressing like high femme in the daytime and then this like totally different I just like I totally compartmentalized it. Yeah. The 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 joy was real. We call it gender euphoria, mm. which is yeah. I'm in my solo show that I made it's all a, it's just about gender euphoria cuz like so much focus on gender dysphoria like how you don't what feels wrong how you don't fit the mold but really what how a lot of trans people figure out that they are trans is because they experience euphoria for the first time and that's absolutely the same the exa- exactly correct for me I didn't even realize didn't have the language to explain what was wrong and then I was like oh this feels great this feels good and that's what sparked the avalanche. Mm. And amidst all of this, how have you found like the navigating with language and labels and and that sort of thing? What's your what's your vibe or what's what what are your thoughts on the the current lexicon? I guess around gender, the current words being used, and and how people react and understand. Totally, I we are in. Magical and super complicated times, right? So, like, I mean, if you were to use, like, our modern language, I'm a femme trans man. And I use he, him pronouns. But, yeah, so, like, language is evolving a lot. And I think the queer community is, like, super divided amongst, like, old and young as well. And also things are changing so fast. And I think people feel a lot of fear about getting stuff wrong because they, you know... We we learn how to be better at all of this every day. You know, the internet moves so fast. I, and I think when people get it, you know, we deal with call out culture, a lot of people being like, you used the wrong word, you got this slightly wrong, and, like, people are so quick to cancel each other. And I think we l- forget it's a... So hang on. So, like, call out culture, like, is fuck you, you're not on our team anymore, right? But really how we, like, grow is, like, educating each other, right? So, like, I've benefited enormously from the kindness that other people have shown me in, like, educating me, right? And experience, like, an enormous amount of, like, distress when I see other people getting rinsed out. I'm like, well, I didn't even know that word last year. Chill, like, 
I think we're like shooting our own community in the foot quite a bit. Strong feelings about call-out culture. What's much harder, of course, is call-in culture because you don't do it publicly. You can't prove that you're smarter, <laughs> you know, because like a lot of the time we're just doing like the liberal Olympics, like I'm the most woke. Um, I love that, <laughs> the liberal Olympics, because that's what I was thinking is like where does the, I guess, the rage that's fueling call-out culture come from? And maybe it is that desire to prove that I'm the most woke, so I'm going to point the finger at you, you and you. Yeah. Okay, call-in culture. Call-in culture is harder because you don't get to prove – you see call-out culture. It's public. It's on the internet. It's in our friends. You know, we see it. Um, and I think that's what why people learn that that's acceptable because they see other people doing that and they're not aware that there's another way. There is another way. It's just private, you know. You send an email, you have a coffee date, you have a conversation, and that's like the meaningful – unpaid there's nothing in it for you work that binds communities you know actually has results because all you're gonna do is make an enemy by by calling someone out this i just see almost i just i see no positives when you can have the exact same educational result while also just like learning more about each other and just not losing a potential friend you know I think it's I look at I look at a lot that's happening in like the liberal scene and I'm just like well this is why we can't have nice things you know like this is why we're so divided and and senseless we're so small we're so fucking traumatized the hardest thing in the world is to be nice to each other but I think it's just so important important and said with a smile at the end there (laughs) so true thank you for that because I I mean, I, there's so much that I don't know. I need to be. There's heaps that I would like to be called in about. You know? Same. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. And like literally everyone. Everyone. Yeah. And it was almost like we have this fear of appearing like we don't know. So we just pretend. Well, I just pretend sometimes that I do know. Not anymore. I used to do it heaps. Like especially um, before I lost my virginity. I used to think that I like knew about sex stuff. <laughs> yeah, 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 so yeah, people yeah. were like oh yeah and then this happened and I was like oh yeah cool and like in my mind I was like what is that the fuck <laughs> yeah how's that gonna work even heaps of stuff and so as a result of that there's heaps of stuff that I ended up putting up with real dodgy consent things and yeah I guess it's okay to say I don't know yet mm. Mm. yeah what it, like I don't know yet can can you help me to know more, maybe, or point me in the direction. Yeah. Mm, loving arms. That's what we need. Groovy. Well, um, if you were to have a bumper sticker that just had like a sweet or a little billboard or a little slogan, it's kind of like flashed along. There was like a message for the world. I have a thing I say at the end of all my shows that I'm hosting. I say, eat your vegetables, fuck the patriarchy, tell your friends you love them. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. That's a good one. What's your favourite vegetable? I'm pretty interdisciplinary in my love of (laughs) veggies. I eat an apple like every day, which I know is not a vegetable. Um, Maybe just like a spring bean. Big fan of a spring bean. Excellent. Yeah, I've started to get a bit irate if I don't get a daily apple these days. It's how I know my age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's four o'clock. I haven't had an apple yet. Um, yes. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the good people? Nah, definitely not. Okay. We, I think we've just gone far and wide with this gone one. Far and wide. Yeah. And that's um, that's a good way to go. I think it's um, it's so nice to be able to to do this with you. And thank you so much for being so open and generous with just your my wisdom. P- pleasure. What a lovely way to start my working day. Um, I'll see you at sh- your show on Sunday. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. That's happening, and then I'll see you the week after at the show that I'm doing for you. It's all happening, and uh, I hope that you can find some time to do some underwater screaming when this is all over. I think or it's during. A really good call. Really yep. good call. Yeah. Okay. That's sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening and sharing your time with me this week. For this podcast to continue, I could really use your support. If you enjoyed the episode, please screenshot it and put it on your social media, send the episode to your friend or family, 
And if you can click subscribe to the episodes, they'll fall into your algorithm like your old friend JJ popping into your ear every week. I appreciate it so much. And as well as listening to this podcast, you can just keep on listening to your own wisdom by asking the questions, big and small, like, does it hurt when you do that? Don't do that. 